All right. So lecture 4.2, Demeter, goddess of the harvest. So we got five things on the docket today. We will start with a, uh, a few announcements. Um, then we didn't quite get out of hell last time, so we are descending back into Hades to finish off uh, the stories of some of the kind of unfortunate souls of the ancient Greek world. Then we will go ahead and uh, look at the actual funerary rituals of ancient Greece, right? What did actual people end up doing when it came to death in the ancient Greek world? And then we're going to go back into Hades yet again uh, for the second time in the lecture, the third time this week, when we start talking about Demeter and in particular her daughter, Persephone. And then finally, we'll bring it back to kind of the actual Greek world to take a look at how the people of ancient Greece engaged with the worship of Demeter. And in particular, we're going to take a look at something known as the Eleusinian Mysteries, a, uh, a kind of mystery religion that everybody could end up participating in. So let's see, do we have any announcements today? Announcements, let's see. All right, classic stuff. Put it into a speaker view so that you can see me, you can see the notes, you can see everything. If you have questions, go ahead and shoot your TA uh, a, uh, a direct message there. And then like during the attendance or something, they can let me know and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Uh, honors projects, I think tomorrow is the last day to actually sign up for these. I could be making that up completely and it could be a totally different date. My bad if that's the case, but I think it's the case. Figure it out yourselves, I guess. <laughs> uh, and then finally, uh, start thinking about those project topics, all right? Uh, so one of the things that we'll do on Friday is kind of walk through an example topic, right? And, and kind of model the process for you in terms of moving from, all right, what's like the initial kind of idea to how do we start to refine that? How do we turn the idea into something like a question that can actually be answered? How do we get it narrow enough to really make it um, a, uh, a fruitful, nuanced topic for something like the final project. So start kind of, you know, hopefully you'll have like a general kind of inclination about what you want to do. And then on Friday, we can start working towards uh, taking that kind of amorphous idea and really nailing it down to something specific. But first, let's descend back into Hades. All right, so just to recap last time, the first thing is like, we gotta figure out what this dude's deal is, right? What is Hades' deal? And in particular, we kind of have to contrast it with modern conceptions um, or Judeo-Christian concept, uh, conceptions of, the, um, of the, the kind of underworld of hell, right? And there we tend to picture hell as this sort of place where people are being tortured, right? You're in the fiery pits of hell, the fire and brimstone, and it's not exactly like that, right? It's not like Satan's torturing you when it comes to Hades. Instead, he's just kind of ruling down in his like underworld, just kind of receiving the souls of the dead, making sure they don't get back out. He's got kind of helpers to do that. But he's not the guy who's punishing people. He's not judging people. He's not um, the guy who's like causing them to die. He's not determining where they go after death. He's just kind of ruling over them making sure that, that kind of nobody's getting out of line, that sort of thing. And for that reason, right, he gets the epithet polydegman or the receiver of many. Now, this spills over into where he's actually like worshipped as well, right? So one of the things is we get very, very, very few places where Hades is worshipped, right? It's not like Zeus or Athena or Apollo, where you get temples all over the places to these gods, right? And the kind of thinking behind that is that the lack of physical sites where he's worshipped is indicative of what he actually has control over. So here you can see kind of one of those few sites. This is a cave at the site of Eleusis, which we'll be talking more about later. Um, but this is kind of one of the entrances to the underworld, but not really like the same thing as like a temple uh, to somebody like, again, Zeus or Athena. And what that does tell us, right, is that the lack of sanctuaries is indicative of the fact that Hades really doesn't have much control over when you die or what happens to you after you die, right? So he's not, he's not controlling when it happens or what happens afterwards. Um, he's kind of really just making sure that the souls stay down in the underworld, that sort of thing. 
And as a result, right, the Greeks don't really put a lot of effort into, into worshiping Hades in the same way that they do the other Olympian gods. Now, I've got one quick message about recording. Um, oh, it is being recorded. I'm just recording it locally on my computer. And, uh, and then I'll go ahead and post it on, on, um, as a YouTube link afterwards. Okay, so now the souls themselves, when they're down in Hades, right, what are they doing? Well, it turns out most of the souls are not doing very much, right? Again, it's not like a heaven and hell kind of thing where like, you know, if you're pretty good or something or you believe something, you go to heaven. And if you don't, you go to hell and you're tortured for eternity. It's like if you're like one of the mythical Greek heroes, you might end up in the Elysian Plain, right? The kind of place of perpetual springtime. And if you're a really, really shitty dude, like we'll see in a second, you might end up in the pits of Tartarus. Not a great place to be. But again, these are reserved for the very, very extremes of people and heroes in the Greek world. The vast majority of souls that we're talking about, well, they're just kind of wandering around the fields of Asphodel, just kind of this place of darkness and boredom, basically, right? So they're just kind of wandering around, not really doing very much. Now, the souls themselves, the kind of conception of what these are like, we can get a sense for these from uh, ancient Greek literature, right? So pulling from sources like the Iliad, we can kind of see how the Greeks perceived these souls of the dead. And we talked a little bit last time, like they, they are kind of like, kind of like ghosts, right? So they kind of look like the person did when they were alive. Um, they kind of have a similar personality uh, to the person when they were alive but they're not like physically touchable, right? So like Achilles reaches out to teach, uh, to touch his best friend, uh, Patroclus, right? But his hand passes right through him and he, he can't be touched. So very much kind of like ghosts of the underworld wandering around the, uh, the realm of Hades. Now, Tartarus, of course, right, is that kind of that really is most analogous to the pits of hell or something like that. That's where you end up going if you're really, really bad and not just really bad to like normal people, but you really have to kind of offend the gods to end up down, um, down in Tartarus. And we saw that we started these stories last time. We see that in a couple different places, right? So with Tidius, uh, we see this giant who tries to rape the mother of Apollo and Artemis, and he gets chained down there and kind of gets the Prometheus treatment, right? He gets his liver eaten out by vultures, and, and that kind of liver is seen as the source of his passion. So it's kind of a, a poetic justice thing there. And we see another one of those poetic justice um, punishments with Tantalus, right? And Tantalus is this guy who just like, just time and again is, uh, is really going against the gods. So first he gets invited to a feast and he steals the, the food and drink of the gods, right? The nectar and ambrosia. And then at another point in time, he steals like the little, little like golden dog of Zeus. Um, and then at another time, he invites the gods over for dinner and tries to feed them human flesh. Um, and, uh, and it, it basically, the gods are like, you've given us human flesh, all except for Demeter, who we'll get to later. She was so distraught at this point that she didn't pick up on it and actually ate a little bit of the, the chopped up son of Tantalus, a guy by the name of Pelops. And we'll talk about Pelops later in the course, um, especially when we get, uh, to, to the site of Olympia. And as a result, Tantalus is sent down into Tartarus and there he's placed kind of like waist deep in water, right? And he gets this kind of poetic justice punishment because a lot of, a lot of his transgressions had to do with food. He can no longer eat, right? Every time he reaches for the fruit on the tree above him, the tree kind of recedes uh, and pulls back. And every time he tries to drink the water below him, right, the waters of the river recede and he can't drink the water. And so he's living in this kind of eternity of per perpetual hunger, perpetual thirst. All right, so that's where we left off last time. We've got a few more of these unlucky souls to cover here. Uh, next up, we've got Sisyphus, right? And you may have heard of Sisyphus before or something like a Sisyphean task. And we'll see why that's the case in just a second. But you may not know about Sisyphus the dude. And it turns out that Sisyphus the dude, not a very good dude. So he's the mythical founder of Corinth, but he treats everybody terribly. 
So he's constantly tricking like the gods. He's tricking humans. Whenever people come into Corinth and he has them over, he's like taking advantage of travelers, regular people, uh, as well as the gods. Um, and what we'll see, and this kind of gets back to um, uh, kind of Tantalus as well at, at like dinners and stuff. The, there's a lot of this that has to kind of, there's a lot of these transgressions revolve around how you treat people when you have them over, right? When you host them, whether it's hosting people for dinner, whether it's hosting travelers, and you think to the ancient Greek world, right? What's actually going on. And you can get a sense for why that's so important, right? Like traveling around from place to place, city state to city state, we don't have the same kind of infrastructure that we do today. And so you rely a lot on people that you don't really know. And this idea of hospitality is just incredibly, incredibly important in ancient Greek culture. And so what we see with a lot of these kind of souls of the damned, right? We see people who have uh, broken that kind of pact of hospitality in different ways. So we see that certainly with, uh, with Sisyphus um, and then maybe his worst transgression of, of all, right? We see Sisyphus snitching on Zeus, right? And Zeus don't, <laughs> Zeus don't like no snitches, right? Zeus is always saying snitches get stitches. And in this case, he puts him down into Tartarus. And the thing is that Zeus was trying to mac on Aegina, who's the daughter of this kind of minor god. And so he turns himself into eagle form, and then he's gonna go try to make out with her. But Sisyphus is like, I saw that Zeus, you shouldn't be doing that. And Zeus is like, well, you know what? You're not really in a position to tell me what to do. And so he puts poor old Sisyphus, kind of poor old Sisyphus, kind of asshole Sisyphus, something like that. Anyway, he puts him down in Tartarus and he forces poor old Sisyphus or snitching Sisyphus, however you want to conceive of Sisyphus. He puts him down there and he forces him to push this boulder up a hill, right? But as you maybe have heard before, right, whenever he gets very, very close to the top of the hill, the rock comes tumbling back down to the bottom and he's got to start once again. And so we get that term Sisyphean task, right? From some sort of task that's just like basically impossible to accomplish. And no matter how hard you work and how close you get, right? Whenever you get really, really close to actually finishing this thing, it all comes tumbling down. All right, next up, we've got Ixion. And Ixion is once again, this kind of terrible dinner guest. So we've seen like the terrible dinner host, right? Guys like Sisyphus, uh, guys like Tantalus. And now we have a terrible dinner guest. And he's invited to go have dinner with Zeus. And during this dinner, he starts lusting after Hera, right? Now, you might think that Zeus would kind of be like, all right, great, give Hera to somebody else for a while, get her off my back. But no, Zeus, of course, wants all the ladies, mortal, immortal, and he wants all the dudes, I guess, as well. He wants everybody and everything. Um, and uh, as a punishment for lusting after Hera at the dinner, right, being a poor dinner guest, he ends up chained to a wheel down in Tartarus, and the wheel just kind of keeps on spinning and spinning and spinning. Uh, so he's kind of given a perpetual punishment of, I don't know, nausea and dizziness. But I, I also really like this, uh, this ancient portrayal of Ixion here, um, where he's chained to the wheel. And I, I just really like his face. I feel like it's a, a very appropriate face for somebody who has to face that for eternity. All right, uh, then, you know, women are not immune to this, right? They can get chained up down in Tartarus as well. Um, so we get the Danaids, the, the daughters, the 50 daughters of King Danaeus. And uh, they all kill their husbands. That's a lot of dead husbands. Uh, but they kill their husbands, and as punishment, uh, they are forced to, uh, to basically go down in Tartarus and fill these vessels, right? Basically get water in these jugs and fill these vessels with holes in it for eternity until they get filled up. But of course, they will never get filled up. So it seems like a very laborious and not very successful task very much in line of like Sisyphus, right? Trying to complete something that's just never going to be completed. All right, so we've got, uh, we've got, we've got Tidius and we've got Tantalus. Um, we've got Ixion, we've got Sisyphus, uh, we've got the Danaids, um, a kind of wide range of people who really stick out as being terrible um, 
mainly to the gods, sometimes to normal people as well. And as a result of just this like incredible amount of, uh, of just kind of disrespect, uh, they get thrown down into Tartarus. All right, so the next question then is, what are regular people actually doing, right? Of course, they're probably enjoying their Greek mythology. I wonder if they thought of it as Greek mythology. They probably did, they probably really liked it. Um, anyway, what are they actually doing for the dead? And uh, we're gonna talk a little bit now about these funerary rituals, and it helps to start by thinking about the purpose of the rituals, right? Um, and, and it's really twofold, right? You wanna think about it in terms of both the deceased as well as the people who are still living. And this is one of the kind of very interesting takeaways when you look at religion, especially religion around the dead. Um, and you, you start to kind of realize that like, like much of the ritual surrounding it isn't really about the dead, right? It's about the people who are like still alive. And it's about kind of performing grief. It's about establishing position within society. Um, it's about kind of showing your place and uh, showing that you fit in with regular kind of Greek society, that sort of thing. So kind of keep that in mind, right? Part of it is about helping the soul reach the underworld. Part of it is about the actual living people uh, kind of perform their loss, deal with their loss through this ritualized kind of commemoration. All right, so when we look at the funerary rituals of ancient Greece, uh, we're looking at kind of a, a three-step process here. And the Greek name for the first step in that process is the, uh, the prosthesis, or the, the laying out of the body. And one of the cool things kind of here, right, is that we can see this in, in ancient Greek literature, um, but we also kind of have archaeological evidence for the portrayal of these things. And so we can kind of get a sense, um, at least in an abstract sense, for how this would have looked. And so here you're seeing uh, a piece of Greek pottery from the era just after kind of Greek starts coming out of the Dark Ages. And you can see this step in the process. So you can see the body of the deceased laid out here. And then you can see the people around it kind of washing the body, dressing the body, um, performing ritual grief. And so you can see over here, right, they're, they're in kind of geometric form. But you can see these kind of women surrounding the body pulling out their hair, scratching their faces, this ritual sort of, um, of performative uh, grief, right? We talked a little bit about this earlier, right? Charon's obol or coin, something placed in the mouth, a token or a coin or some sort of like um, cake or something like that that's left with the body in order to give the ferryman so that the soul can successfully cross the river Styx and make it over to the land of Hades. So step one is the prosthesis, the laying out of the body. Step two in Greece is known as the ekphora, or the taking, the, the kind of procession of the body from the kind of place where it's um, prepared to the actual grave site, right? So this is the funer funeral procession from where it's prepared to the grave site. And all along the way, once again, we see that people are kind of doing this performative um, lamentation, right? This performative grief. And so here we have women kind of, uh, we have women kind of pulling their hair. We have them singing uh, kind of dirges, right? Songs for the deceased, songs of lamentation. The men are raising their hands in mourning. It's not just kind of an internal emotional grief, right? This is something that's um, meant to be seen by others, right? It's meant to, to kind of show society how much you cared about this person and the sadness uh, that you're experiencing now that they're gone. And then finally, uh, we get the third step in the ritual, and this is the, the kind of uh, celebration at the grave. Okay, so once you actually get to the grave site, there's this kind of big feast um, and they actually like invite the soul of the deceased to come hang out and like eat some of the food that they brought with them, right? They perform that as a sacrifice. Um, and what you're looking at here, uh, this is actually the cemetery right outside of the, uh, the city walls of, um, of Athens, uh, known as the Keramikos, because it used to be the potter's corner, the ceramics corner of the city. And so you can still go see what some of the funerary monuments end up looking like uh, at, the, um, at these kind of grave sites. 
And you can see that uh, monuments, and you know, it, it really in many ways, the grave sites are similar-ish to what you would see in a, a cemetery, right? You can see some sort of monument marking the tomb and people would have gone there to have their feast and celebrate. And then they keep coming back for about a month to continue to leave offerings so that that soul can successfully get to the underworld. Okay, so when we think of uh, the actual funerary rituals, what people are actually doing, right? To recap, we've got the prosthesis, which is the laying out and the preparation of the body. We've got the ekphora, which is the funeral procession from the kind of site of the preparation to the grave site. And then we've got the feast and the repeated visitation to that grave site um, to both celebrate the deceased and to ensure that they make it successfully to the underworld. All right, so let's go ahead and turn our sights now to Demeter and her daughter, Persephone. All right, so uh, Demeter, uh, just like everybody we've talked about so far, the, uh, the daughter of Cronus and Rhea, meaning that she's uh, uh, the sister to Zeus and Hades and Hera, whom we've all talked about. And you can tend to identify uh, Demeter because she's got <clears throat> attributes like uh, this wheat stalk, right? Um, and a torch and these kind of like a cornucopia frequently, uh, things to do with the harvest, right? We generally consider Demeter the goddess of the harvest. We'll talk a little bit about um, some of her rituals and sanctuaries in the, the later part of, uh, of the lecture today. Um, but to kind of start, we'll start with some kind of weird stuff like Hera, who's the sister of Zeus and makes out with Zeus, and then they become like, I don't know, husband and wife of Olympus. Demeter does the same thing. So Demeter hooks up with Zeus as well. And uh, together they have um, Persephone, uh, their daughter. Now, when we look at Demeter, right, back to fun with etymology. I know it's been a few lectures since we've gotten to talk etymology. Um, Demeter is basically another way to say like Mother Earth, right? So we have Gaia. Um, and Gaia is kind of who like the original Mother Earth was. But when you break down the, uh, the word Demeter, it gets back to the same thing, right? So that duh at the beginning is related to ga, which gets to Gaia, which is our word for Earth. And then meter, right, is related to mater, um, which gets to mother, right? So Demeter is very literally, right, the duh meaning Earth, meter meaning mother, mother Earth, Earth mother, something along those lines. And we still have words like today, right? Like people's names today. When you get a, a name like Demetrius, I don't know if we have any Demetriuses in this class, but that basically means you're devoted to Demeter. You might not even have known you're devoted to Demeter, but you are if you're Demetrius. Uh, and then finally, right, the Roman version of Demeter uh, is Ceres, right? And that's where we get our cereal. And that's what gives us Cinnamon Toast Crunch, which is the best cereal there's no real debate about it. I like, you know, that's just is the way it is. Cinnamon Toast Crunch is the best. Don't mess with CT Crunch. All right, let's move on. So Demeter, Persephone, and Hades. Um, and uh, let's go ahead and start with this story. Once upon a time, the whole world was just green and spring-like and fruitful all the time. Uh, somebody's coming at me with like, Crunch berries, now don't get me wrong, right? Every once in a while, the crunch berries are delicious, right? But Captain Crunch, it cuts the roof of your mouth. It's not as good as CT Crunch. So, all right, yep, all right. My audio isn't working? Is my audio working? No? Okay. All right, so, okay, good, we're back. Anyway, okay, so the world was wonderful and green and it was uh, like, unlike Tucson in the summer, it was like Tucson and, February or something. Everything was very, very nice. Um, and Demeter has a little fling with her brother Zeus, right? And Zeus is just making out with everybody. Um, somebody says life is the best cereal? Come on, that's not even, that's not even top five. Um, and uh, they have a daughter, they have their daughter Persephone. And Persephone is like, per picture like Persephone is like, like, you know, a classic high school kid, right? Like Demeter loves Persephone like a lot and she gets like a little overprotective. And Persephone is just like, I don't know, like, like high school, right? Like it's like, you know, she understands her mom loves her and that's very nice, but she just wants to like go hang out with her friends and like go play in the fields and just wants to be like, mom, just like 
leave me alone for a little bit. I'm not going to get in any trouble. Just chill out. And so Persephone is kind of wandering her way and going to hang out with her nymph friends and that sort of thing. And Demeter's constantly freaking out. And Persephone's like, Mom, like, leave me alone. It's going to be fine. Of course, it's not going to be fine. And one day she's out picking flowers with her like oceanid nymph pals, right? And they're just picking these beautiful flowers. And then she gets this one flower that she like, she like picks out of the ground and the ground collapses and out pops Hades, god of the underworld. And Hades is like, whoo, man, this honey is fine, right? And he's like, man, she is really looking good today. And so he winds her and dines her and takes her out to dinner. No, he doesn't do any of that. He's the god of the underworld. He's like basically the Zeus of the underworld. So he does not take her on any dates. He just grabs her and takes her down, kicking and screaming into the underworld. This is like one of the... <laughs> This is like one of my all-time favorite, like, um, I don't know, ancient depictions where they're like trying to, to capture, right, the, the, um, the snatching up of, uh, of Persephone. And they, <laughs> I don't know, like Hades is there with like his like buns of steel and Persephone is just like, hey, I, I assume she's not happy. But anyway, it's kind of a humorous looking um, depiction for something that probably wasn't very humorous at all. Anyway, Demeter, right, is already a little bit paranoid, a little bit overprotective, and so she goes out and starts searching for her daughter, right? And she's wandering all over the place, and she's going here and there and up and down and east and west, and she's just, like, freaking out to the point where, like, she's stopped doing what she's supposed to be doing, right? She's the goddess of the harvest, and she is supposed to be, um, you know, making plants grow and have this eternal springtime. All right. Next up, uh, along her journey, she ends up in the town of Eleusis. And Eleusis is about, I don't know, 14 miles or so west of Athens, right? Fairly close to Athens. And there at Eleusis, she's taken in uh, by a family, right? So a family kind of hosts her while she's there. And as a thank you to this family, she decides to make their baby immortal, which is great, right? Who doesn't like that, right? Your baby's going to be immortal by Demeter. But the problem is that, like, the way she makes the baby immortal is by sticking it in the fireplace. And just by a bad stroke of luck, like, the, the family, like, comes down while the baby's sitting in the flames. And the family's like, what the hell are you doing to our baby? And Demeter does not take kindly to that. They didn't know it was Demeter at the time. She was like dressed up and like, it was not obvious. And she's like, you should have just let me stick your baby in a fire. I was trying to make it immortal. And then there, like, she gets really pissed off and just like leaves. And in order to make, um, uh, basically, um, get back on Demeter's good side, uh, they say that they're gonna build a temple to Demeter at the site uh, of Eleusis. And that's actually what you're looking at here. We'll see this again a little bit later, but this massive, massive temple to Demeter, um, which ends up being the kind of main sanctuary for the mysteries that are gonna be associated with the goddess. All right, so she's still wandering all over the place. She's neglecting her godly duties. Uh, things are dying, right? Crops are dying. At some point in time, the other gods and goddesses are like, Demeter, like, I know it sucks that your daughter is gone, but like, now we're having to deal with this and we're getting annoyed by it. Can you please just, you know, just find your daughter. And so Demeter keeps wandering around and she's wandering around and she's wandering around. And eventually she finds the goddess Hecate. And Hecate is like this goddess of magic and uh, witchcraft. And she's gonna help out Demeter, right? She's this kind of mysterious person. We actually see uh, Hecate or Hecate um, show up in the uh, in Hesiod's Theogony as well. She's this very kind of mysterious um, goddess. And uh, originally Demeter sees her with these two points of light carrying these two torches, which you see here. Um, and Hecate is going to help. And she says that like, look, I do not know where your daughter is but I do know somebody who might be able to help. 
and you should go see Helios, the god of the sun. And uh, the uh, the <laughs> somebody says the, the the guy over here is <laughs> looks like he's wearing a Yoda hat, <laughs> which he totally does look like he's wearing a Yoda hat. That's Hermes. Those are supposed to be his like wings, so he can like fly around. <laughs> but may maybe it's also Yoda. So anyway. Um, anyway, Hecate says, Demeter, go find Helios, right? Um, who, uh, who probably saw this because he's always up in the sky looking down on things. Um, and, uh, you know, he'll be able to help you out. So Demeter goes to see Helios and Helios is on his chariot of fire, just like in this crazy fiery chariot going across the sky. And Helios, he's like, he's like, sure, uh -huh, I'm a good guy. It was Hades, right? I saw it. Clear as day, I, I kind of am the day, I saw it, Hades definitely took your daughter. Now, the next problem is that even though Demeter knows it was Hades, she can't just like go down into Hades, right? Even though she's a goddess, you can't just like wander down into Hades and like go take people out of there. So she's like, okay, well, let's go like, you know, it, this is also the daughter of Zeus. He's kind of a big deal on Olympus. Let's go see what he has to say. And she goes and talks to Zeus. And she learns that Zeus had promised Persephone to Hades long, long ago. And she is not happy, right? So Demeter is furious at this point. She's pissed off big time. She gets her like harvesting scythe out and is ready to like kill Zeus. And Zeus is like, I don't have to take this. I'm the king of the gods. And he's about to throw like thunderbolts at her. And finally, finally, somehow things calm down a little bit. And Zeus is like, all right, let me send Hermes down there. He's like the guy who brings souls down into Hades anyway. He can kind of get a little bit further than, than you can down into Hades. Let him go get Persephone. So we're moving in the right direction. Things are looking a little bit more positive. The problem, though, is that it's been long enough now where Hades and Persephone, they're like kind of getting along, right? So they're like hanging out and like talking. They're kind of having family dinners, which is not a good idea to have if you're in Hades. Um, here we can see an ancient depiction of Hades uh, and Persephone down there, right? And again, in addition to being the god of the underworld, he's sending up um, good things, uh, sending up right things like wheat and stuff like that to um, to the surface. Now, the problem is these family dinners are causing big problems. It wasn't a very good dinner. I mean, I don't know. I, I wouldn't be filled up by this. I would need some, some CT crunch in addition to this. But I guess he served her a pomegranate, right? And the pomegranate is that fruit with all those little seeds like you can see here, right? And she's just like, she must have been on a diet or something. She's just eating the seeds one at a time. And eventually she eats six seeds. Um, and it's the only fruit grown in the underworld. And that filled her up, I guess, for dinner, but it's gonna cause problems. The problem is that once you eat the food of the underworld, you can like no longer go back to like the regular world. And so they have to get everybody together for like a Zoom meeting, right? So they get together their Zoom meeting and you've got Zeus and you've got Hades and you've got Demeter and you've got Persephone. Um, and they like are talking this out uh, and they come up with this arrangement, right? Where they're like, how about, right? She only ate six seeds of the pomegranate. How about for every seed, she will spend one month down with Hades in the underworld. And uh, then she gets to spend the other six months back above ground, right? And this, of course, if you haven't heard the story, right? This is where we get our seasons. So for those six months, she is down uh, with Hades, right? That is like fall when things start to die and winter when they're very, very dead. And then the six months up on Olympus uh, with her mother Demeter, that's when Demeter actually gets to around to doing her job. And that's when we get spring where things are growing and uh, summer, um, and, and summer where things are, are flourishing, right? I mean, not so much in Tucson, but like, you know, like in other places, like things are nice in summer. Anyway, 
Let's go ahead. That is the story of Demeter and Hades and Persephone. Go ahead and uh, put in your, your attendance for today. Um, so the answer for today is yellow. Go ahead and put in yellow for today's attendance, and then we will get started with the rituals of Demeter. Okay, so uh, while you're doing that, a few like questions coming in. Uh, was the guy wearing a Yoda hat? I don't know. It was either Hermes or Yoda. Really, there's no way to tell. Um, have I had chocolate cinnamon toast crunch? I have not, and I think it's blasphemous. I'm against it. Um, did the Greeks have a 12 month calendar? I thought the Romans added some months. Uh, that's a great question. Somebody find the answer and send that to me. Um, uh, was Zeus the one who decides Tartarus punishments, or does it depend on the myth? That's a good question. I don't, I'd have to look into that. I'm going to look into that. I'm going to come up with an answer to, to who gets to decide these punishments. Special K is the best. No, Special K is very healthy, and it's, it's not the best. Denied. Um... Churro cinnamon toast crunch? I've never had this. Let's see. I, pomegranate seeds in the cinnamon toast crunch. I don't know, I think they'd work better in the crunch berries. Lucky Charms. Lucky Charms is, it's okay, it's okay. It all depends on how many marshmallows you get. Here's what I wanna know. Let me go ahead and throw out like a, a poll. I wonder if I can create a, a poll. Edit. No, oh, that's gonna take too much time. You can just put it in the chat here. Um, oh, we have a great answer from our, uh, our one of our great TAs. Uh, Katie says, the Greeks, as early as the time of Homer, appear to have been familiar with the division of the year into 12 lunar months, but no, uh, in intercalary? I don't even know what word that is. <laughs> Month, uh, em uh, embolomos. Uh, or day is mentioned, when the 12 months of 354 days, independent of the division of the month into days, it was divided into periods according to the increase and decrease of the moon. Yeah, all right, well, there you go. Did I know that Taco Bell is making their own wine? A jalapeno noir. No, I did not know that, but if somebody wants to send me information on that, I will try it. Reese's peanut butter puffs, pretty good, pretty good. Right? I'm not saying cinnamon toast crunch is the only thing you should eat, right? But it is the best and you can you can have other things like Reese's peanut butter puffs or crunch berries or uh, whatever, like supplementing it. Lucky Charms, all good stuff, all good stuff. We're very inclusive here. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> let's, let's actually go back to talking about mythology. Um, oh, what was my question gonna be? What was my question gonna be? I, I don't know. I don't know. If I remember it, I will ask you. Okay, so the rituals of Demeter. Uh, it may not surprise you that many of the rituals of Demeter um, have to end up doing with agriculture, right? And again, like, we don't tend to think a ton about agriculture. Most people don't think a ton about agriculture in the modern world, right? Because we get a relatively small number of people being so effective with the agricultural production that it feeds like everybody else, right? Small percentage of people feeding everybody. Um, in the ancient world, it was kind of the other way around, right? You got most people involved in agriculture and uh, they are um, feeding themselves and then have a little bit of surplus to, to feed people who are involved with things like, you know, artisans or politics or whatever else. And so the, uh, the rituals associated with Demeter revolve around this idea of fertility and it kind of ends up being a parallel, both like fertility in agri excuse me, uh, agriculture, as well as fertility uh, with people. So what we get first is we get the prorosia, all right? And this is like a ritual plowing, right? So, so agriculture comes in, in kind of seasons, it's cyclical. So before you go out planting the actual seeds that you're gonna do, 
you do this kind of ritual thing where you give an offering of Demeter, you kind of like plant some ritual seeds, and the idea is is through this, um, the, uh, the fields will be very, very fruitful. The more exciting festival uh, that I really like uh, is known as the Haloa, all right? And this is interesting in the sense that it's it's kind of a, uh, a fertility festival, um, but what it really does is it inverts gender roles, right? Um, it's a women-only festival, whereas much of kind of Greek religious ritual is going to be male-only, right? Only men can do it. This is the opposite. This is only for women. The idea behind it is that it's going on during winter, and they're trying to make sure that the seeds that they've planted survive the winter. And during this ritual, what we get, again, is this kind of inversion of roles where women are the center of it. Men end up putting on a feast for the women, right? So rather than the women giving a feast for the men, which would be the way things normally would be in Greece, now men are giving it to the women. Um, and then the women do like, like, you know, they basically adopt a lot of the, uh, the male uh, things that they would normally do. So instead of men at a symposium getting drunk on wine, now it's women during the Haloa just getting real drunk on wine. They're telling like dirty jokes. They're eating like, we know from the text, they're eating like pastries and cookies that are shaped like uh, phalluses. Um, and so this sounds just like a, a hilarious party. Um, and again, the idea behind it is that the seeds over winter will not die. Uh, another one of the rituals that we have associated with Demeter is known as the Thesmophoria. This is a three-day ritual. Um, and uh, during the first day, we get the kind of worship of Demeter. The women leave the house. Um, oh, somebody says it's kind of like a bachelorette party. It does kind of sound like a bachelorette party. <laughs> um, yeah, in honor of the, the seeds of winter not dying. Um, so, yeah, the Thesmophoria, we get the women leaving the house to go worship Demeter and Persephone. Day two, we get a similar sort of thing, right? Um, they're uh, telling jokes. They're telling obscene jokes. Um, and then day three, uh, they end up breaking their fast and feasting. And one of the things that we get here is we get the, uh, the, the kind of inclusion of these tiny baby little pigs. And so what ends up happening um, is they end up uh, basically burying things in these pits, especially like kind of pig bones. Um, and then uh, like that's kind of a sign of fertility. And we're going to see pigs come back later on uh, as well. Um, and once again, just like the, uh, the Haloa, right? They're eating these kind of cakes and cookies that are shaped like fertility symbols, right? So shaped like genitalia, shaped like snakes, pine cones, all things associated with, uh, with fertility. Again, both for people and for agriculture. All right, so over the last five minutes, I wanna talk about the Eleusinian mysteries. So those are, are three of them, right? So we've got the Proerosia, the Haloa, uh, and the Thesmophoria. And then we've got the Eleusinian mysteries, right? And these are known as mysteries because it involves some sort of secret kind of uh, initiation and some sort of secret activity or knowledge. And we'll see with this one, we don't actually even know what that secret knowledge was. But this is based on the time in that myth of Demeter and Persephone when she's at the site of Eleusis, right? And it's that time when she is so sad, right? And the family's taken her in. And the, the servant of that family, this little guy, Balbo, makes her laugh, puts a smile on her face. And as a result, right, she wants to make the baby immortal. And we saw earlier that the way she does that is she puts the baby in the fire. There weren't a lot of images of babies in fire. So, uh, so this is one of the ones I could find. Um, the king and queen get upset, right? Demeter storms off after revealing herself and the family decides it's gonna build a temple in her honor. And so what we're looking at here is the giant complex at Eleusis. And it's this thing right here known as the Telesterion. That's the actual temple of uh, Demeter here, right? That's where the Eleusinian mysteries, after this kind of procession, that's where the mysteries themselves are going to take place. We can also see kind of uh, other parts here. Where is it? The, uh, the Plutonion right there. That's like kind of attached to the cave um, and the, the one little place, the entrance to the, uh, the underworld there that we saw pictures of earlier. So 
The, uh, the Eleusinian Mysteries is a week-long festival in September. And one of the kind of cool things here, right, is that anybody can participate, right? And once again, we saw earlier that this is somewhat, somewhat unusual, right? Religion can be very restrictive to certain parts of society, right? Usually the free men. Um, but here, with these mysteries, it gives everybody a chance to participate. So women, men, slaves, everybody can participate. You don't have to, right? It's totally voluntary. And uh, it's just about your kind of interest in doing so. It's not like you have to do this as part of the city-state. Once again, we get little, little tiny cute piglets coming back into it. This is the only thing you need to be able to participate in the Eleusinian Mysteries, just a tiny baby pig. Um, and again, people have speculated why that's the case. Pigs kind of symbols of fertility. Pigs were also uh, a slang name in ancient Greek uh, for like a young girl, so something to represent like kind of Persephone, something along those lines. And the first thing you do is you process from Athens uh, about eight or nine miles away down to the port of Piraeus. So this is modern Piraeus down here, right? Athens with the Acropolis, modern Piraeus is the port where the kind of cruise ships come in. Um, but it, there assumedly wouldn't be cruise ships in antiquity, but that's where you go. And uh, you bathe yourself and your tiny little pig, piglet um, to cleanse them. Then you start this walk and you go 14 miles. You walk from Athens down to Piraeus, where is it? Piraeus down there. And then you go from Piraeus over to Eleusis. And when you cross this river in here, you get masked people teasing you, mocking you, maybe embodying the kind of uh, crude humor that Balbo, that little like uh, servant of the family used to make um, Demeter laugh during her trip to Eleusis. Now, when you get there, um, you finally, you first kind of uh, take your pig, you sacrifice it, uh, you offer, you give offerings to Demeter, you walk around the entire sanctuary. And then finally, right after the sacrifices and after the procession, you finally enter uh, the Telesterion, the Temple of Demeter, and that's where the sacred rites are initiated. Yeah, so you kind of make your sacrifices, you go around the sanctuary, and finally you enter the Telesterion over here. Now, what happened inside, right? That's why it's a mystery, right? Nobody knows because it was a secret. Um, so we think uh, from later writers who make kind of allusions to this, that initiates were shown or taught something sacred, right? Um, later Christian writers talk about feasting and drinking, the opening and closing of some sort of box. People have made uh, different kind of suggestions that this was either kind of the primordial stock of grain, right, from which all grain arose, or other kind of like cakes or something like that shaped like genitalia, like we've seen with the Haloa and the Thesmophoria, something along those lines. But there's some sort of, uh, some sort of, of of thing that you see as an initiate into the mystery religion, once you get into the temple, we're still not sure what it is. So our takeaways with Demeter, right? She is an overseer of both agriculture and death, right? Persephone is down there for part of the year. She is up kind of taking care of agriculture for part of the year. Um, when the, the kind of female experience, um, they, they end up playing a fairly big role when it comes to Demeter in these uh, kind of fertility rituals, both for people and for agriculture. Um, and the idea is that uh, Demeter offers kind of fertility when it comes to agriculture, and it offers some sort of, of kind of hope for death, right, with Persephone going into the underworld, but eventually emerging uh, for all of us. So we will go ahead and wrap up with that today. For Friday, go ahead and read the Homeric Hymn to Demeter. That's where we get much of this story. Uh, go ahead and complete your reading response and come with some rough topic to Friday where we'll get to talk a little bit about how to mold that into something really nuanced. So have a great couple days and we will see you Friday.